music of our land tumbles down through the misty hills of our past, we are as inseparable from our music as we are from the storyline of our ancestors. Those rich experiences fashioned on instruments made by hand, ringing out in song and dance, are our musical roots. This is Americana, the living traditions forged long ago in little towns, speckling open fields and hollers, that hide gathering places still living and breeding volumes of music today. These are Americana women, their roots musicians. Their lives reveal chapters in an American story that reflects a boundless people. We'll fill some pages of history today with women playing fiddle tunes and banjos, tinkling the ivories and wailing on guitars from juke joints to back porches across the country. Let's hear their tales. Let's listen to their tunes. My name is Yvette Landry, and uh, I was born here in Burbridge, Louisiana, the crawfish capital of the world. And I do come from a family of musicians. I also found out that it goes back six generations on my grandmother's side of the family. Uh, we are descendants of the, the Acadians of Nova Scotia, and the first A-Bears to come over were musicians. At the age of three, I started playing piano. My dad's sister, Joyce, um, was my first piano teacher here in this house, actually, which is uh, my grandparents' house. The church music was a huge factor in my southern upbringing. From my, my Methodist grandparents to my mother, we were always at church in choirs. People were singing hymns. It was a huge part. That and songs around the campfire, because that was another big activity in my southern life, was hanging around campfires with my grandparents. They had an old Civil War house, actually, and um, um, we used to sit out by the fire. He'd sing all kinds of songs. I'm a Mary Broussard, an old Creole player, and this song I'm getting ready to play will be the Lake Charles Two Steps. Uh, today, there's so many of the uh, of the people that was into that music is not there anymore. I was in Mayhem, we're going to Township. Well, not August, August 29, 1929. I'm still 18. <laughs> uh, I look at my mama, she was praying to get her, uh, and I stole her guitar. That's the way I learned how to play. Because old folk, long then, they put sugar and black pepper on you and feeding you up. sit at the park, play some play after working in the field, and we played for square dances. So when I was 13, I played square dances until I got married. My husband had two wrong feet. dad came over from England. He ran away from home when he was a boy. They lived in Wigan, or just near Wigan, which was a kind of coal mining area. And his dad worked for the coal mines. And he was, he was a singer. He was, didn't play anything, but he sang. And my mother was a real good piano player. My father's side is white and my mother's side is black. But musically speaking, it was actually pretty similar. My earliest musical memories are listening to, I guess my mom's mom, blues and all that sort of stuff, but she also listened to Hee Haw every Saturday night. 
watched Tee Haw, you know, so we knew it was, that was going to be on. And, and then my dad's mother, Margaret, she listened to old country and gospel. Dad uh, played, has played guitar since he, was, since he was young. He used to hold himself up in his room and play for like four or five hours till his fingers bled. I mean, he was just really into it. I think from growing up in Woodstock, New York, the influences there were so varied and I saw music at a very early age. The first concert I got to see, um, and my mom took me to it because my guitar teacher was in the show, but the first show I saw had uh, Van Morrison and Odetta and John Hammond Jr. and uh, it made quite an impact at, at a really young age. I think it really arranged some brain DNA for what I came to do later on. starting so I, I wanna I wanna be like Cindy Cash out you know I have that that to look at and, and be as good as her I would love that when I was about 10 years old over several years my mom and dad every summer would go to see different artists at the Carter Baron theater in Washington, D.C. They always, each summer, went to see Ella Fitzgerald because that was my daddy's thing. And they always went to see Harry Belafonte. That was my mama's thing. And one year, it was Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. And that's when I heard and I found the music that I loved. I wanted uh, to be my life's soundtrack. I was a big Nina Simone fan. She's playing the intro to I Want a Little Sugar in My Bowl, and she whispers, Bessie Smith, y'all. It's like, oh, I need to check this Bessie Smith out. And I did. And, uh, and again, my life has not been the same since then. Uh, once I found Bessie, and then I found Ma Rainey, and then I found Ida Cox, and then I found Victoria Spivey, and uh, uh, Lucille Bogan, and who is also Bessie Jackson, and then it just grew. It was like, oh my goodness, listen at the stuff these women are saying. And that's where I found my history. I felt it was important to perhaps create a program that would feature Maine women musicians playing the music that was collected from women by women and even women's songs about the woman's experience here in Maine. We have a lot of the lumbering and the, the seafaring traditions which are typically male traditions but of course, incorporated into those traditions are the women's experience. Um, there were cooks in the lumber camps. There were, you know, uh, women that uh, associated with the sailors in one way or another. Um, <laughs> wives and not wives. These songs, they fill out the information about this lifestyle. It's not all yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of Guinness. <laughs> that, that, that's that thing, you know, with oh, as a, a woman musician, you're always, you know, your radar is just out there trying to spot another woman who does what you do. Definitely. And so we, you know, connect it right away. And I was like, are there, are, are there any others of us <laughs> out here in there Central are Texas? Others of us. <laughs> I would sit on my front porch for a little bit. 
Come on down. Milam County, Central Texas. Right on the Brazos River where I was raised. It's hot down there. Lots of sunshine. Sit on the porch. We'll go in the house and grab you a beverage. Maybe two. In my little small town. To me, roots music is um, its what you show up with. It's kind of like what Odetta did mm -hmm. and just never strayed from. She, she stayed there. It's, it's you being who you are. This is what I call my two-step at blues. And that's what I showed up to New York with, and it wasn't enough. These guys were they're trying to turn me into uh, Anita Baker meets Tracy Chapman, is what I gathered from it. I did this photo session, and I'm getting laughter all around me because, <laughs> because it was with this incredible photographer, this, and, and he took these wonderful pictures of me, and I made these little uh, postcards, and I sent a postcard to my dad and he got this postcard and he called me and he says, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I got something in the mail and I, I, I looked at it and the first thing I said was, who is this white woman with my baby's nose? <laughs> and I thought, okay, that is enough of that. that is Not going to go this direction because my daddy wouldn't know me first. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to do something that my people are proud of. I was playing when I was 11 years old at Sarah's Kitchen with the Deep Cuts. They, uh, you know, everybody would probably get paid about $100 a piece, and I'd play five hours straight with these guys, and they handed me $11 because I was 11 years old and a white girl. And, you know, it took a long time for me to, to build respect from all these blues men, you know, around here. And it, it was really hard. And, uh, but girls have to work just as hard, you know, if not more, than guys do around here that, that are in the music industry. And it's just, uh, I hope that gets better at one point because uh, it was hard for me, that's for sure. I think I just grew up knowing that I was going to be a musician. When I was in high school, I had visions of being a rock and roll star. But, uh, being a blue star is, is a little bit cooler. You can get away with more stuff. <laughs> I still have plenty to look forward to, but I don't have to be beholden to a whole lot of people. I don't have to do the NBC Today Show at four o'clock in the morning if I don't want to. In that way, it's it's uh, it offers me all the joys and the benefits of being able to travel and meet people. Americana women have been long-standing bearers of our cultural traditions. As more women see themselves in the mirror of their role models, more attain self-assurance and grace. Yet, they face challenges like the double burden of balancing work and mothering, and the anytime, anywhere needs of career mandates. And so we see, the road is by no means paved in gold. It's interesting, just 
this is 2010, just this year in Banjo Newsletter, there was an article written by a man about upcoming banjo players. He was called Young Guns of Bluegrass. Yeah. No women. I'm, I'm tired of fighting this battle. I've been doing it for so long. Casey got in contact with the editor of Banjo Editor. He owned his, you know, mistake. He goes, you know, I'm sorry, that was, duh, I shouldn't have done that. Why were no women included? Is that because it's still hard for women to find a job in the nationally known bands? Many of them play in family bands, many of them play in local bands, but it's still hard for women to find uh, the job as a banjo player or any or an instrumental level of instrument of any kind in the touring bands. It's just difficult. Even with my own research into the subject of women in bluegrass, and I think there are way more women out there that were instrumentalists that, that we don't know about, we probably never will know about. They played locally, and that's, uh, it skews the picture a whole lot. Um, I think we're seeing more young women taking up instruments. You know, and I always wonder how much of this is actually related to two other things sort of outside the bluegrass field. One is the whole, uh, it's a Title IX, they get, get all women uh, playing sports. You know, you see women, more women integrated into sports now, and I'm wondering if that has fed over into the realm of bluegrass. And then uh, I see a lot of homeschool kids that play uh, music, and they seem to be, to my experience is they're sort of two to gender equally. And so that the, the sisters play as well as the brothers, there doesn't seem to be any discrimination. So uh, I think that's a really, really good thing. I'm Casey Henry, and I'm going to play for you a tune that I wrote. It's actually the title track of my um, banjo instrumental CD. It's, got, it's called Real Women Drive Trucks. But this is what it sounds like. it's harder for a woman uh, instrumentalist, side musician, to get work than it is for a guy. I interview a lot of banjo players as, as a writer. I write for a banjo newsletter in Bluegrass Unlimited. So I did a, you know, an interview with um, a guy who's roughly my age. He's a little younger than me. He you know, started playing, I don't know, I guess at about the same age I did. When he got to an age, I don't even know if he was out of high school yet, like he just kind of stepped into a side person job. Like I never see that happen for women and it certainly didn't happen for me. You know, there's just that, there's that spot, there's that boy banjo player slot where you can just plug in one or the other boy banjo player and uh, there's not a curl banjo player slot that you can be plugged into. One summer, it was the Klezmer Revival. I played in the Catskill Mountains at a Jewish hotel. Uh, why was I hired? Because the band had a girl singer and they had to have somebody to share a room with her. They treated, oh, it was awful. Anyway, they told Pearl, who was the singer, uh, they said to Pearl, you're going to sleep with the drummer. So she said, I'm not sleeping with any drummer. And then she found out it was me. Uh, First song we're going to play is the Erste to uh, No, Ethan. Why do I keep saying that? Because you're not a professional. I'm not a professional. It's all keep right. that in. Frank did this project from 2002 to 2007. Klezmer music and um, gypsy music. And we kind of smushed them both together. And our first project was in Hungary. And these guys did not know what to do with me. Now these men came from a village in Serbia where women aren't, they aren't allowed to touch an instrument because you can make a living. One year we went to their village and it was amazing because again women aren't allowed to do anything but have babies and stay home and and we went and we played in their town hall and 
I got up there and Frank allowed me to have a solo. And I said in their gypsy language, I said, women, this is for you. And I played this just big ass trumpet solo. And at the end of the concert, there was a line of women just coming up, wanting to shake my hand, crying. And they just said, we've never heard a woman play like a man before. We've never heard a woman do anything as good as a man. Well, I don't even think twice about being a woman and being able to do this. When really the world has taken women and plunked them and subjugated them in such a way that they're just hushed. When, uh, when Alex was born, my daughter Alex was born, I was on the road all the time. Let's play the blues. <laughs> changed everything. I remember looking at her when she was born, before they had to whisk her away, I had a second with her, and being sort of startled that I didn't recognize her. I guess I thought I'd know exactly what she would look like, and here she was, her own little, her own little face. I'm like, hi, I'm your mom. But being a mom, that changed things. It changed my touring schedule, it changed what I wanted to do, it changed how much I wanted to do and was willing to do. Um, I didn't know that for a few months. She started going on the road with us in three weeks learned to take first steps with a big backstage pass on her little romper suit. I didn't want to be away even though her dad was a great stay-at-home dad. That, that wasn't working for me. And I felt like I was becoming a half-assed everything. And that really wasn't working for me. So I'm like, all right, don't want to be away from Alex as much as I am. So let me just try to see what I can do with where I am. And I started playing more weeds from late. There's so many issues facing our world right now, and I think I feel pretty close to the cause of, of wanting of the kind of support local movement. Um, living in a small community, you, know, you have to drive 20 minutes to get a grocery store, but it's like music is the, part of that for me. It's like I play traditional music, but part of that tradition is go to your neighbor's house to hear music or support local bands or make a square dance happen in your town instead of feeling like you have to drive an hour away to see some big country music star and you're sitting in this auditorium with like 3,000 people. That's not anything, that's like the Walmart of music, you know? It's like instead of, instead of having this little corner store that has personality and you know the people there and you can get a vegetable from your neighbor or from like a local farm it's like now you know that that equivalent would be hearing the music of your neighbors and and playing music with your neighbors i'm valerie june and i wrote this song the working woman blues because i feel like many times as a working musician when i think about having a family it seems a bit challenging and I know that it can be done but I thought it was song worthy. I had a lot of encouragement and it was Memphis encouragement, you know, other musicians. I ain't fit to be no more. I ain't fit to be no wife. I've been working like a man. that you should be and challenge somebody else to step up and be better you know and do the same Because another thing is that I just realized like how short 
life is and how like I'm thinking I'm gonna be like Violet and live till I'm 93 and play music and that's when it'll matter. No, I need to do it now, you know. I don't know how long I'm gonna be here. Why not do it now?